The legendary words, smile, you're on Candid Camera. The guest we have today right here on our show is Peter Funt, and he's with Candid Camera. Welcome, Peter. Hello, John. Nice to be with you. <laughs> Candid Camera, those two words right there uh, and encompass a lot of your career and your dad, uh, Alan Funt's career. And uh, could you tell us a little about how this all started way back when, I think in the 1940s, I guess, as, uh, in, as a microphone, basically, right? Wow. Yeah, it's a long, so you have a few hours oh, for sure. this story. <laughs> <laughs> 1947, my dad had this idea, and it began as a radio show called Candid Microphone. And the following year, 1948, he took it to TV. It became Candid Camera. And off and on through all of his career and most of my career, we've been doing Candid Camera. Uh, there have been pauses in between, <clears throat> but we're the only entertainment show in television history to have produced new episodes in eight different decades. Wow. So uh, that's quite an achievement, and I thank my dad and his great idea for that. Well, and, and uh, I, rumor has it that you started off on Canon Camera at the age of three. Tell us a little about that uh, episode. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said I remember it very well. <laughs> I was three, but uh, my family tells me that my dad sent me out on the streets of New York City with a shoe shine box and told me to ask $10 per shoe. And I guess the idea was to see how business people primarily would react to such an audacious young entrepreneur. You know, John, here's the sad thing about that story. Back then, they never saved anything. Mm -hmm. They shot it, they put it on the air, and they threw it away. So there is no record of that anymore. And uh, fortunately, years later, my dad and then certainly I changed that policy and we carefully save everything now. But isn't that a shame? I mean, Johnny yeah. Carson used to, his family tells the story about how so many of the Tonight Shows don't exist anymore from early in Johnny Carson's career because NBC just erased right over them. Um, so that's tragic. Yes, we don't have that anymore, but yeah probably better in story form <laughs> than the uh, video was anyway. Yeah, and, and you still have a lot of a collection, even though the, the first several years were not recorded. Oh, yeah. Thousands yeah, yeah. of sequences, John. In fact, many of them, uh, hundreds, 400 or more, are on our two YouTube channels. That's correct. Uh, Candid Camera Classics and Candid Camera Gold. And uh, the folks can go to YouTube and... Uh, enjoy a lot of those smiles. And, and on top of, the, just to mention, uh, on top of the Candid Camera YouTube, uh, your career also, you've written a lot of books and you've got some uh, books of recent that you've written about your days of Candid Camera. Well, I have, you know, it started during the pandemic. We couldn't really do television. In fact, we couldn't do very much, any of us, uh, during lockdown and all. So I thought, boy, I'll be really clever and write a book or two. Little did I know that practically everybody and their mother in America was writing a book at that time, and it was kind of kind of a flood there. But I wrote two books one, during that period. One was my own story, and I call that one "Self-Amused: A Tell Some Memoir." Mm -hmm. I didn't want to tell all, you know. That's that's <laughs> that's risky business, but it's a tell some memoir. And uh, so the folks might enjoy that if they want to read about Candid Camera's history and my dad's experiences and plenty of my stuff. And then more recently, in fact, just this summer, I put out a new book that has nothing whatsoever to do with me or Candid Camera. Mm. It's just a reporting project, but it's a fascinating one. The book is called Playing POTUS as in President of the United mm -hmm. States. And playing in this context means the story is about the impressionists or mimics, if you will, who have impersonated U.S. presidents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Dana Carvey doing George H.W. Bush or Chevy Chase doing Gerald Ford. And, you know, right up to the present with people on SNL 
at least when the strike ends, doing um, Joe Biden. But as I looked into this story, mm -hmm. I became more and more intrigued with all the uh, elements of intrigue, the presidents who befriended some of these impressionists and the battles that some of these impressionists had to do edgy material. The story just got better and better. And you may recall really the beginning of the story was in 1962 when a fellow named Vaughn Meter, that okay. was the performer's name, did an impression of John Kennedy, President Kennedy, uh -huh. on a record album that was called The First Family. Uh -huh. And that album became and is to this day the biggest selling comedy album of all time, seven and a half million copies. And it really launched this whole thing because prior to that time, believe it or not, it, it was nobody did impressions of sitting U.S. presidents. It wasn't that it was against the law. It just wasn't done. You didn't do that. And then Vaughn Meter's album started it. And bingo, everybody started doing it. So we've had 12 presidents now who have been roasted and impersonated. And I interviewed a lot of them and mm -hmm. it made for a really good book. So the book is called Playing POTUS and it's on sale now as is self amused. You can get it at Amazon or at the Candid Camera website or wherever. But uh, okay, that's my commercial. <laughs> uh, that's not, no, no, that's a great commercial. And uh, basically, uh, you mentioned that you met uh, several presidents, and uh, who, who, not to be political or anything, that's saying that you know you're saying anything good or bad. But who impressed you the most of all the presidents you've met? Oh, I'm I'm happy to say uh, things good or bad, but no, I I think without question the most impressive president in my time was Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. I, I think the guy just radiates brains and charisma and instills confidence, mm -hmm. at least uh, he, he did and does in me. Um, I think a U.S. president who got sort of a bad rap while he was in office, but history will see him as one of the greats, was Jimmy Carter. I agree. Um, you know, such a decent man. And back when he was president, maybe we didn't think decency was quite that important. Uh, Nowadays, uh, I think it's one of the best attributes a president could have, if only we could find one of them. Because, uh, you know, the, 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 these are troubled times, mm -hmm. and decency goes a long way, as does smarts, with, which Jimmy Carter had. You know, in my book, I point out how Chevy Chase did the impression of Gerald Ford. It coincided with Ford taking office and the premiere of Saturday Night Live. That's when it began on NBC. Well, doing that Ford impression catapulted Chevy Chase to becoming a superstar, but it also ruined Gerald Ford's career, and that's no exaggeration. Mm -hmm. Many historians smarter than myself point out that those week after week impressions that Chevy Chase did depicting Ford as a bumbler and a stumbler, mm -hmm. which weren't wasn't true. He was he was not clumsy, he was a great athlete, and he was quite smart. But that impression stuck and was a major factor in his losing his effort to win a full term. And that's the sort of stuff I was uncovering along the way and mm -hmm. able to interview people about. And as I say, it, it just makes such a rich and interesting story. Now, uh, on top of everything, you know, obviously being a journalist, I mean, uh, you've done uh, other things in research. There was, uh, I've heard through time that you researched the, the last PM newspaper that has ever been uh, that's been going on or I guess it's because it's becoming a dying thing across the country. Yeah well yeah um, boy that's good research John I almost forgot about that. Uh. That was a piece I wrote in the Wall Street Journal 
because I love newspapers. I mean, I guess I'm dating myself, but oh. I love the I love the physical newspaper that you can hold in your hand. And I've worked for newspapers on and off throughout my career. I still do, um, but it is sad to see so many of the print newspapers fading away, and the afternoon papers and evening papers are are now basically extinct. They, they just don't exist anymore. The papers that still remain, and there's a lot of them, are morning papers that come out, you know, in the middle mm -hmm. of the night and delivered in the early morning. There is no such thing anymore as an afternoon paper. And those of us who as kids delivered papers in the afternoon, mm -hmm. you know, that was a big source of employment for t young teens and kids on a bike. Sure. And uh, so that whole thing, disappeared too when afternoon papers disappeared so yeah i i looked into that uh don't get me started too much <laughs> about the sad demise of oh, the newspaper business because i think we're all going to find that we're paying some kind of price for that i don't want to be too highfalutin here but there is a difference in how we absorb news as mm -hmm. consumers on the screen versus on the printed page and i think on screen we've all become sort of professional skimmers mm -hmm. we scroll through stuff and skim and we think we're sort of getting it but we're really only scratching the surface and uh, when you read a newspaper um some of the news rubs off just the way the huh. ink rubs off and i think that's a good thing that we're going to be sorry we don't have in the future. I remember when I was a kid, uh, well not even a kid, this was back when, um, about, let's say about 25, 30 years ago, uh, when the Kansas City Times and Kansas City Star, I remember that, was, I'm sure that was a story of a lot of papers across the country. You had your morning edition, you had your evening edition, and the morning edition, gone. Boom. No more. And you had the evening, now that's become that one main paper, like the Kansas City Star up in the Kansas City area. And I'm sure that's an uh, example for many cities across the country, right? But. Well, but to be clear, they now publish in the morning, right? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. That's yeah. But they used, but yeah, used to have a morning version and the evening version, but the evening exactly. version kind of went yeah, back to the morning. Yeah, exactly. My goodness, growing up as I did in the New York area, believe it or not, um, some of the New York City papers a few decades ago mm -hmm. published seven or eight different editions per day. My goodness, almost around the clock. Um, yeah, that's just, uh, now we get that on television and uh, well, well, where, <laughs> cross where, our fingers. Uh, where do you, now where do you, as being, uh, knowing about a lot about print journalism, where do you think uh, modern day television journalism is going? Which road is that going to be over the next 10, 20 years? Well, you know, I'm a fan of, of journalism in all forms and I watch a lot of the news on TV. Mm -hmm. I I find it interesting that even though it's not written about very much, the three major evening newscasts on legacy broadcast channels, NBC, CBS, ABC, those three evening news programs collectively remain the most highly rated television news in the country by a long shot. In other words, a lot more people are still watching that than watch mm -hmm. CNN or Fox News Channel or MSNBC. But round the clock, most of us turn to one of those cable channels. And um, there's quite a battle going on there because, you know, MSNBC has kind of staked out the left side of the political mm -hmm. spectrum. and. Uh, Fox News Channel is way over on the right side. CNN is somewhere in the middle. And what I just defined, I think, is part of the problem for consumers. You shouldn't really want to get your news from a source only because you agree with everything they say. Mm -hmm. That's not the best way to make your own judgments about things or to be objective about the facts. And uh, it's a little frightening that we now uh, sort of pick our, our poison, as it were, and we gravitate to outlets that don't inform us so much as they reinforce what we're thinking. 
and that's that's not really healthy for society. Um, they call it the echo chamber, mm -hmm. <laughs> meaning that if you agree with everything that's on MSNBC, you tend to watch it a lot because it echoes the things that you agree with. And so, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about where TV news is going. It is a business after mm -hmm. all, and ratings and advertising and subscriber fees support those businesses. So it's got to work as a business. And right now in cable news, nobody's exactly sure anymore what the business formula mm -hmm. should be and where it's headed. And uh, basically, uh, going back full circle, back to Canon Camera, any stories? Oh, good. <laughs> any, any stories that you know, that, John? Uh, my whole life does that. No matter what I do with <laughs> back these to full books circle or articles or whatever, uh, I circle right back to Candid Camera. And I mean, thank goodness that's, for that. Yeah, I mean that's. I mean, my goodness, uh, Candid Camera. I mean, any stories that stand out in your all your career, your dad's career, that stand out that, like there, like something that didn't work out, like it was supposed to, or anything like. Yeah, let's say sure. Got bad. I can tell you I mean, one you, quick. Okay, sure. When I was a teenager, so now I think I'm about 16 years old in this story, uh -huh. my dad and the crew and I went to Seattle, and my dad had this idea that we could make what he called an upside-down room. Uh -huh. So everything that should have been on the floor was bolted upside-down to the ceiling, mm -hmm. you see, and then the real floor was painted white so it looked like a ceiling. The idea was if somebody were to walk in, could they be tricked or confused about whether they were upside down or, you know, what was happening? Now, in order to complete that effect, he needed someone young enough, uh, nimble enough, mm -hmm. dare I say stupid enough, huh. to hang upside down sitting in a chair from the ceiling in order to complete the picture. Uh -huh. And that was me. Uh, and there I am, you know, the blood rushing to my head and people coming in the door and they encounter this vision. And, you know, nothing funny happened at all, John, in the my course gosh. of the whole day. The people were so panic stricken after they peeked in uh -huh. that they just backed away, slammed the door shut and ran down the hall. We got nothing. Well, and it cost a fortune to do it. And my dad learned that day, and I remembered ever since, you have to be careful. There's mm. only so far you can push people with a joke or a, a concept like that, after which there are <laughs> severely diminishing returns because people just shut down. Mm -hmm. So you asked about a failure. That was a oh, whopping oh. failure. But uh, you know what, John? Uh -huh. If people buy my book, uh -huh. now how about tying this to a plug, Self Amused, <laughs> the book Self Amused, the cover of Self Amused, I don't have one handy, but uh -huh. the cover of Self Amused is a picture of me hanging upside down and my dad giving me <laughs> last minute instructions. And so you see, it made a good picture and a good story, just, just not a very good TV <laughs> sequence. And in a minute we have a left or so, um, where do you see uh, this Canon camera going on for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? I mean, oh I'm boy, sure. how about 30, 40 minutes, John? <laughs> I, I, I can't look that far into the future. I'll tell you this, Candid Camera, thanks to my dad's vision, mm -hmm. is a great and I believe timeless idea. Mm -hmm. Indeed, there'll always be new people to photograph because they're being born all the time. Uh -huh. And there'll always be new jokes to make because the zeitgeist is evolving. So I'm happy to say I'm working with some of my producers right now on a new version of Candid cool, Camera. Cool. I can't make the announcement just yet, but you know, as they say in TV, stay tuned because in the next coming months, maybe early next year, we will be back on TV, and I'm so tickled to be able to do it. Well, Peter, uh, I would like to thank you for being on the show here, and your theme for Canon Camera, Smile, on, you're on Canon Camera. You've certainly given everybody a smile in, their, in many generations, and including my generation, myself. I think my mom and dad, I remember just growing up, we'd watch the Canon Camera at home, along with a lot of other families across the world. 
You just gave everybody a smile, so thanks for giving us all the smiles. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for those kind words. Nice to see you, John. Good to see you. Take it easy.